people remember stories. They don't remember the details of this or this formula or things like that. They remember things that happened to them. They remember the story that you tell them. And so I try to relate stories to the students to get them involved in sales and to get them to understand these are some of the things that can go. I tell them the things that I did wrong and the things that I've made mistakes on because we can all learn from that. And it's, it's not embarrassing or anything else. It's just, Hey, I screwed up and I learned from it. So rather than make you do that same mistake, let me just tell you a little bit about it. Hey everybody, Jason Cutter here. Welcome to another special guest series on the Authentic Persuasion Show. This one's going to be a blast. If you're here, if this is your first time, welcome. If it's not your first time, then my mission is to fill the world with authentic persuaders. And I love doing this podcast and bringing people on because it's a way to help you if you're in sales leadership, or maybe you're a fellow professor like the professors I've had on this season where you're developing out or you want to develop out a sales program, hopefully this will help you. Hopefully this will help you inspire more people in the way that sales could be done, especially as a service. And of course, fill the world with authentic persuaders. On this series, starting with right now, we're going to talk about authenticity. Super excited to have Professor Brian Collins from Virginia Tech's Pamplin College of Business on the podcast. And so he is a professor of practice for sales and marketing at Virginia Tech. He is the sales center director, the sales competition team director, serves as the PSE sales fraternity advisor. Um, before joining uh, Virginia Tech, he spent over 20 years in the financial services industry, banking, M&A, sales. He has his bachelor's in finance with a minor in English, which should be fascinating to talk about, and an MBA in finance from Virginia Tech. And he's been there since 2015. Super excited to have him on the show. Brian, welcome to the Authentic Persuasion Show. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Let's just jump right into kind of the background that led to where you are, because I think this is fascinating, especially when I see things like you have a bachelor's in finance with a minor in English. Let's talk about what was your plan with that? And where did that intersect with kind of sales experience that you ended up having well before teaching? I'm a frustrated writer, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. Originally, when I went to school, I was thinking I would be an engineer. And then I got to school and I thought, no, I'll be a business major. That sounds a little bit better, a little bit more of my speed. And uh, I've always been a creative writer. And it's something I've always enjoyed. Uh, I don't get to write very much anymore just because of, of being busy. But one day I hope to be able to add that, but it's really helped me in the sense of communication um, and being able to have the time, especially from a written standpoint, to be able to get points across. There's been times in my career where I've had to write directions or things like that, and it helps me really relate to other people. And so it's been a big help. Um, I, it, it was something that, that I would have loved to have been able to done to do full time and be an author and be the next Stephen King or something, but. That's really, my strengths are there, but my better strengths are in the world of sales and finance. And so it uh, just really helped me support that. And I really enjoyed it. It's so fascinating. And what I would say is, like you even pointed out, but where is that intersection even in the future of the sales, the business, and the writing as that part? Like, it's like for me with marine biology and then going into sales, a lot of people are like, can you go back into it? What could I help sell in the world of, or persuade in the world of marine biology? You never know. You never know where that could lead to. So where, where did you enter into sales as work in business? Where did that begin for you? Interestingly enough, I, I ended up coming out of undergrad and went straight into grad school. And I did that because at the time I came out, I had a lot of job offers and I liked none of them. Really, none of them appealed to me. I didn't want to. It was funny, as I look back on that time, many of them were sales jobs. And I was thinking, no, that's not necessarily what I want to do. I want to be a CFO of a bank. That's where I wanted to be. And uh, when I came out, I actually went to work for the Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, got training there and so forth. And the sales didn't really come along until after I left there. I was there for a couple of years. I got hired by a bank 
to run their retail uh, side, retail credit side and, and running branches. And of course, that's all about going in and how many sales that your loan officers can make. Back then, we didn't really have the metrics that we have now. So a lot of that job was setting of the metrics. How many things can you sell to a certain person? We called it just entanglement, which is probably what they still use, but being like a spider, right? If I can get you to have a checking account and a savings account and an overline draft and a mortgage, all those things, credit card, you're less likely to leave because yeah. we've made it too hard on you to do that. And so those were the things that I started with immediately out of the gate from coming from the Fed into uh, my first job. Some of it was compliance side, having to write, but a lot of it was also having to manage the the other salespeople within the organization. Um, and these weren't huge banks. You know, uh, first one was probably 100 branches, just a, a super regional bank within the state of Virginia. So what did you think about the role relative to sales and or what did you think of sales in those early days? So the early days was really interesting because I had never thought of doing that. Never really occurred to me that, that would be a place where I could be happy just because I had, I was so focused on that. I want to be the CFO. I want to be the guy who's mm -hmm. in front of the stock folks and saying why we our earnings are where they are. And what's really funny is now if I had to do that, I'd be so bored. I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> um, for me, it really started intriguing me as I got more and more into it. I, I ended up, that bank was bought out. And I parlayed that into working for another bank in North Carolina, doing the same thing, but uh, at that point also had credit card underneath me. And that really got me interested in sales at that point, because I could see where making small differences in products and marketing could really translate to much higher levels of loans sold, basically having credit lines and things like that. Uh, and it, it really got me excited about becoming a salesperson. So you said something that's interesting that kind of struck a nerve with me, which is in l thinking about it now and looking back at your goals and, and, and vision of yourself as a CFO, like you definitely wouldn't want to do it. Like, what do you think led to that shift or what were you like? I guess for me, I'm just curious because, you know, I think this happens to a lot of people happen to me where like you think you're going to go on this path and then stuff happens and you look back later on, you go, oh my gosh, like I would not have been happy in that mode. Is there anything sure. you can pinpoint or is it just this whole evolution you had in realizing sales and marketing? I think one of the things that really hit me during that time period in banking was the CFO, both of them that I had wonderful people, but they stayed in their office. They didn't go see people. They, other than talking to the investment community, they weren't necessarily involved with the clients. They weren't necessarily involved with the people who walked through the doors. If you were to walk in, no one necessarily, who's a client or a customer would know who they were other than they're on the, the information that you have for your annual report. And that kind of struck me as being Yes, I can have a big impact, but no one will really, I won't be able to, to see people. I won't be able to shake their hand. I won't be able to thank them. And it almost became a thing where I probably be better suited for the CEO rather than the CFO, just because that's gonna be the face of the company. And so that's when I started to realize I really love finance. I love numbers. I can, you know, things in my head are not a problem, but I didn't want to sit behind a desk and I didn't want to be really separated from the clients that we have. I wanted to know what they thought and how they viewed us and why and how we could change and how we could make things better. And to me, that was exactly what sales did. So it really, it got me really started on that. And, and I just wonder, because I know this will come up at some point in our conversations for the podcast relative to the students that you see and their kind of thoughts in the beginning versus the evolution they may go through, but just where that thinking you want to do a certain role or thinking what's involved, but not really understanding it and not realizing it's not a good fit. Again, you, would you have been happy in an office doing that work and not interacting with people versus what you found out about yourself or 
learned that was available in the world or even built the confidence and understanding in yourself. I think that's just a, a fascinating kind of journey where a lot of people might end up in something where it's just a square peg in a round hole, but sure. they don't do anything about it. Yeah. It's, it was definitely something where as I started to get, and I think part of it was perhaps I didn't, we didn't have things like sales curriculum and things like that back then that you could go and take. And you could go into a discipline back then thinking, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a financial salesperson or an insurance salesperson or something like that, or like me, a CFO, that's what I want to do. And you can get blinders on and you don't really get exposed to some of those other things that are there. And I think that's probably why it took me a little while too to realize that, hey, that's not really where I want to be because I like the other stuff too much. I like the interaction. <laughs> I like talking to people and it, you don't have to like to talk to people to have a, be a salesperson, but it certainly helps to be able to do that. But I think it, it, that just really started to appeal to me. And I started being, my eyes were open to other avenues. And I started thinking, wow, that'd be cool to do that. That's something that I really enjoy. And really, it, I'm, I'm a very curious person. I'm, I'm always asking questions or that kind of thing. So it that whole process really fit in with being a salesperson, the why, right? Being the, the two-year-old kid and going, why, 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 why? That's, that's salespeople, if you're good at your job, you're asking those questions and you be quiet and you listen and hopefully find out something. Yeah, it's so important for that curiosity to have that part because then you want to know. I think one of the biggest things that can hurt a salesperson's effectiveness is when they think they already know everything or they think they already know what that potential client wants or what people in that industry need because they've seen enough, right? And they get it all. And then they just stop asking questions and stop being curious. So I love that you brought that up. Where in the sales kind of evolution you had, because you didn't think you were selling like you just were in this role, but it wasn't really the sales that you're talking, you were, you were thinking, right? Like insurance sales or, or something like that. At what point did you realize it was sales? And then where did you have training on it? Or were you making it up as you went along and, and developing you and your authentic sales style? In, in 2000, so 1999, 2000, the second bank that I went to work for got bought out. And uh, I was fortunate enough at both places to have a pretty good buyout being on the executive side and it allowed me some time to think about things. And in doing that, I started my own business actually at that time. It was very short lived, but it was a SBA small business association administration lending business and started that. And then I found out that my wife and I were going to have twins. And so it became, Hey, I better get a real job and do that. In it just so happened I went into a company called Robert Half. You may be familiar with them. But I went in to talk to them about being a consultant for them, not working for them, but, but being on the consulting end. We discussed things, and next thing I know, they said, well, why don't you come work for us? You could be a division director and do that. I'm like, this is true sales. <laughs> this is my one chance. I've been talking about this for seven or eight years. This is my chance to put my money where my mouth is. And go in and be a salesperson. And I give them a lot of credit, Robert Half. It's a tough place to work. And from a staffing capacity and things like that, I was on the consulting and the IT and I had two different divisions that I managed, but they gave tremendous training. Mm -hmm. If you could stick with what they were doing and you could go through and understand why, you were successful. But you had to do the work. And they really instilled in me that process that here are your metrics, here are your things that you need to do. Even if you don't agree with them, do them. And then let's see the results. And if the results aren't where they are, well, then we'll talk about it. But if they are, then you need to trust us and you need to, to move forward. And they really did a great job of continuously training. I was there for two years or so, and I give them just a huge amount of credit for how my sales career was shaped. If you can stay in a, the staffing world for two years and be successful, you're probably going to be a pretty good salesperson, at least from that era, because it was sink or swim. 
there was no, it was, if you didn't do well, you were on a 30 day plan and that was about it. So, you know, you had to survive and sell and they gave you the tools. So like I said, I have to take, tip my hat to them. And I often do. They really provided me that base. I, over time have changed it and it's become the Brian Collins way of selling, but that base is Robert Half. That's where I learned it. So what did you, what did they teach you about the sales part, right? So this episode obviously is focused on authenticity, but like, where was that? Cause you mentioned process and the metrics and all that, but what about your role in the sales process, especially being a finance writing focused person prior? It's interesting that you asked that because it was very different. So the division that I was in, you could only sell to the C-suite because what we had was one expensive, but two, that's where the decisions were made. Selling to the C-suite is very, very different than selling elsewhere. And I learned that very quickly. And one of the things through training was you're not going in to sell stuff. That's not how you're going to be successful. You have to be genuine and understand and be concerned about what their problems actually are. And can you solve them or can you help them solve them? I wasn't always the best solution for them. And sometimes I had those conversations. Hey, I would love to be able to help you, but actually I'm probably not the best. I could put you in touch with somebody and hopefully that'll help you. And, and that all helps with them understanding you're not just there to every time you knock on the door, hey, give me a sale, right? You're there really to help their business and to help them grow. And Robert Half taught me how to have some of those conversations of the inquisitiveness, the why does that work that way? How does that affect your business? If you didn't get this done, what would it mean to you? What would it mean to your business? How would it affect you going forward? If there were a way we could partner together to work that out, would that be something you'd want to do to help you? And it really is that genuine uh, caring about, uh, at the end of the day, I wasn't as concerned about whether I got a sale. Trust me, I was assessed that way, but I was more worried about, can I help them? Can what can I do to make them better? Because I found that by doing that, the sale was an afterthought. It was easy. That was never a, a place where you got caught up. But that genuine caring up front, being authentic with them and really, truly listening, that was where uh, that conversation was a very different conversation. It, and that actually set me up later, too, for M&A, because in doing mergers and acquisitions, you're talking to the CEO, the president, the owner. It's the same types of conversations. That structure helped me, that authenticity of saying, being honest, hey, look, I just want to help. If I can, I can. If I can't, I'm not going to keep beating on your door. I'd love to be a server. I would send people information that I found. You got to remember these early days of internet, right? So information that you find out there, articles that come up, things like that. Hey, I was just thinking about you, wanted to give you some information that may help you in your business. I love that. Obviously the game has changed because there's so much information out there. Yes. You can do some of that at scale, but most people have access to all of it much different than it was before, right? Like the step before that for B2B, especially relational long-term salespeople was an article in a magazine or a newspaper and photocopying and then sending it to someone because they might not have that magazine or that newspaper right now. Everyone's got the same overwhelming amount of internet. So it's like, all right, how do you send them something that you're, hey, I was thinking about you. Here's these 43 articles that I read this morning in, on the website. So transitioning to the students. So working with students starting obviously 2015, focused on the sales and the marketing side. When you go through that, because we don't need to talk necessarily yet about what they think about sales, but when you're going through that story and you're talking to them about your experience and then that authenticity piece and the relationship building and is it a good fit and not trying to make a sale in that phone call, just like building something long-term, how do they take that? How do you instill that in them? Obviously, that's probably groundbreakingly different than what they think sales is is involved with or requires? That's a, that's a really good um, description that you just gave because they really, a lot of them, 
their feeling of sales is what most people's feelings of sales is a negative, right? It's the people who are knocking on your door at, you know, eight o'clock at night wanting to kill all the mosquitoes in your yard or sell you a vacuum cleaner or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with those types of sales jobs, by the way. I give those folks a lot of credit. It's a lot of doors shut in your face. You learn rejection real quick. But a lot of people have, especially students, have that perception. And I'll even say, how many of y'all have salespeople in your family? Your mom, your dad, that kind of thing. And, and you'll see people, yeah, yeah. But they'll still have that view. And I'll say, is that your mom and dad? No, they're nice people. But I'll say, okay, well, how does that separate, <laughs> right? And, and trying to use that and, and making sure that uh, you're connecting with them on that side. But I use a lot of stories to tell for the, the students to get them involved and to, to transition in and stories from my career. But also um, I had a CEO, one of the best CEOs I've ever had. Her name is Jan Alpert, CEO at Land America Corp. And she started, believe it or not, as back then they called them secretaries, administrative assistant. And she worked her way up through the entire organization, Fortune 500 company, and became the CEO. And uh, when I was at m and I worked for her and she was an amazing person in that she told me, she was like, people remember stories. They don't remember the details of this or this formula or things like that. They remember things that happened to them. They remember the story that you tell them. And so I try to relate stories to the students to get them involved in sales and to get them to understand these are some of the things that can go. I tell them the things that I did wrong and the things that I've made mistakes on. because we can all learn from that. And it's, it's not embarrassing or anything else. It's just, Hey, I screwed up and I learned from it. So rather than make <laughs> you do that same mistake, let me just tell you a little bit about it. So I think that changing of their perception, because certainly as a lot of students come in, the last thing they're thinking about is being a salesperson. They want to be, they all want to go work for the big four. They all want to, you know, go work for Google or, you know, Amazon or whomever and stay at home and, play on the computer or whatever and, and, and get paid, uh, which is fantastic. But I think once they start learning about what a B2B salesperson is, it's a very different perception than what they think of salespeople because primarily their exposure has been B2C, which is a numbers yeah. game. And and how do you help them shift that perception of usually it's short-term transactional sale, right? Like buy this vacuum, buy this car, buy this couch then it's over versus longer sales cycle, more relationship, more trust building. Like, what do you teach them about that? Or what do you recommend for someone, let's say entering in sales or struggling with sales with that, like the trust side and where authenticity fits in? I think that you really have to step step back for a second and understand where your clients are. You mentioned just a few minutes ago that we we're no longer necessarily the givers of information, right? We can all go online and uh, search something. And, and quite honestly, probably now your clients are at least as astute and informed as you are, if not more. Because if you think about that CFO who's going to buy the next cybersecurity software to protect his or her company, they have probably done a tremendous amount of work on which things out there fit. So they're not necessarily looking for that word I used to call show up and throw up, right? Here's all the stuff and you can please buy. They're looking for that story. They're looking for why I should go through. And that goes back to trust. And that goes back to being authentic. Quite honestly, people deal with people they like. So if you and I are both selling, we probably have products that are fairly similar. We probably have products that cost within the same amount relative we probably have the same reviews online, all that kind of stuff. We're working at good companies. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is you or me. And if I'm going to be a, a CIO working with you, why would I work with somebody I don't like and don't trust? I'm going to pick the person I do trust to do. How do I do that? As a salesperson, I can't go in and lie to them or misrepresent or anything like that because that immediately breaks that and they're going to find somebody else who can provide it to them. So if it comes down between the two of us and, and you've built that trust and I have it, you're going to win. So I talk about that in the classes of that's the reason why it's so important to build trust and to 
build authenticity and to make sure that your client is there with you and trust you because otherwise they're going to seek out somebody else who can give that to them because they've got everything else. They can go Google it and get a billion responses. Now. Yeah. And I love that. That's a great segue into where we'll start on part two when we talk about persuasion and sales process, because uh, there's a bunch I want to ask you about that trust process, especially if it's salesperson A and salesperson B in the running, talking to that CIO or whoever that buyer is, the old school way or how you differentiate it and do it obviously in, a, in an authentic way. That's where we'll start the next episode. People tuning in, make sure to catch that. I know we're going to pull that one and just keep running with that one. We talk about persuasion. Um, for people tuning in, Brian, that want to connect with you, I know that they can connect with you on LinkedIn, which is where we connected as a result of just me networking with lots of sales professors. They can find you, Brian Collins. And what I love is I always look at this on people's LinkedIn's. Yours is slash Brian Collins sales which is awesome. Like you've just committed to that. And the link will be in the show notes for people tuning in. Also, I will have the Pamplin School of Business in there as well. And the link for the marketing program and all of that. Brian, thanks for being here. Time flew in this discussion about authenticity. I can't wait for the next two parts, but thanks for being here and uh, sharing all this so far in the episode. Thank you. And for everyone tuning in, as I do this because I want to help encourage and change the way that sales is done. Obviously, the first part starts with authenticity, changing that thought about sales being this gross thing, or you don't want to get into it, or you don't want to use the tactics that other people use, or the things that you don't like as a customer. That's why I'm here. That's why the show is here. Help you make that shift and change that in the world in general. And that's why I love having people like Brian on the show here because he's teaching the future of sales. So please keep tuning into these episodes, keep getting these the nuggets from this so you can change the way that you're selling and make yourself into a sales professional. And until next time, thank you for helping fill the world with authentic persuaders.